Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. Hello and welcome. I'm Anita D'Amico, the CEO of Code DX. And today I'll be moderating a timely and important panel on securing elections in the post pandemic world. We've assembled a diverse group of experts from federal and state government and from the commercial sector to address election security issues, how to manage them, and how COVID-19 has accelerated the conversation about web-based voting. Joining us today are the Honorable Alex Padilla, who is the California Secretary of State. Also joining us is Mr. Matt Masterson, who is a Senior Cybersecurity Advisor at the Department of Homeland Security. Also joining us is Mr. Bryson Bort, who is the founder and CEO of the cybersecurity company, Scythe. Welcome to our distinguished panel. So let's get started. The United States 2020 presidential election will occur soon and over 100 million Americans will vote using a variety of methods with or without an auditable trail. The pandemic is causing part of that electorate to cast votes using different forms that they may not have traditionally used. And Americans have questions about the security of that process. So today's panel of election security experts will answer several of those questions. For example, we're gonna talk about how did bad actors try to affect the 2016 election? And what lessons have we learned from that that we're applying in 2020? We'll also discuss what are the security issues that exist in traditional voting systems that will be used in 2020? We'll also discuss the key responsibilities of the federal and state governments in election security. We'll discuss some of the security issues that exist with the new mobile voting platforms and how they can be addressed. And finally, we'll discuss what can be done to instill confidence in the election process in 2020. I'd like to start with a question about what we've learned from past experiences. Um, I'd like to address this to Matt Masterson. Can you recap some of the various ways that bad actors have interfered with prior elections? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, so what we know from 2016 is uh, that uh, in this case, the Russian uh, government targeted really three buckets uh, that we think about. The first is infrastructure targeting. We know that they targeted and in a, a small number of cases gained access to uh, voter data. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, the Illinois State Board of Elections voter registration data was accessed and taken. No evidence uh, of changing of any records, but we know that was a point of interest for them. The second uh, was targeting of campaigns uh, and campaign infrastructure, emails and otherwise. The, the famous example being uh, John Podesta's email uh, to either get communication or critical information from the campaigns. And then there's the disinformation in and around both the election process uh, and the campaign and candidates. So those are the three buckets we know from 2016. Uh, but what we also know uh, is one, uh, that the same playbook is not likely to be used again in 2016, that we're in a different environment. Two, as evidence from uh, the recent statement from the Director of National Intelligence uh, last week, uh, there are more actors uh, that are taking notice uh, in what happened in 2016 and trying to uh, engage uh, with our elections uh, and at least uh, spread disinformation or doubt about the process. And then three, uh, we continue to see just through our visibility into election networks, uh, cyber criminals uh, targeting election infrastructure or at least county and state government and having an impact on election infrastructure. And so as we look back at, at sort of uh, 2016 and what's happened since, uh, what we've learned uh, is that we can't assume uh, the same playbook uh, and that uh, we really need to focus on that resi those resilience measures, which enable election officials not just to protect those systems, but maintain the integrity of the process and keep it running uh, throughout. Thank you very much. Bryson, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so I represent the offensive security research side, aka the hacker. And the first thing I want I really like to, to highlight here is you don't have to technically compromise a system or a device to compromise it. Um, particularly when we're looking at election security, it's a question around public trust and transparency. And that responsibility of showing that trust and that transparency goes all the way from the different levels of government, the manufacturers, 
um, and everything that's operating the whole piece of it. And so if we look at um, elements of what we saw in 2016, the Russians compromised our trust in, in those elements. And the governments all throughout in the last four years have done an outstanding job of really rising to meet that challenge. Um, I think it's also worth noting that if we looked at how the campaign happened over the summer of 2016, there was a moment there where the Russians actually got caught and there was a strategic pause. They stopped doing what they were doing. And I think it's worth noting that because that pause was their fear of what would happen with being caught. And when nothing happened, they continued to do it again. Mm -hmm. Since then, of course, we have seen a much more robust response at all levels um, in 2018 and 2020, which is why I would like to highlight what Matt Masterson said about that there is going to be something different. And I think the two things that we've seen is we talked about criminal groups. Well, that ties to the increase in ransomware that we see, as well as what we see as the rise of proxy attack groups, which is that um, countries like Iran and Russia have hired other countries or other groups to um, actually do the, the offensive operations on their behalf. It makes it harder to trace back. Exactly. Right. Uh, Secretary Padilla, uh, I know there are lots of lessons learned from those prior experiences. Uh, what's being done uh, in California that's different since 2016? What lessons have you applied? <laughs> Oh, where do we begin? I mean, I think for starters, it's uh, keeping Matt Masterson on my speed dial <laughs> in case we hear uh, or suspect anything. We're looping in our partners uh, in real time so that we have a, as complete a picture uh, of a cyber threat uh, as possible and, and take any necessary action. But you know, using the 2016 experience as a guide uh, and frankly, uh, a little bit of the Mueller report and the indictments prior to that, as uh, uh, Matt mentioned, you can kind of categorize what was happening in 2016 in a few buckets. Uh, and, and I'll kind of use his uh, uh, buckets uh, as examples. When it comes to the political campaigns and other organizations uh, that are involved uh, in, in around an election, you know, our job on the government side is simply the elections administration side. You know, we, we don't provide extra support for political candidates or political parties, but to the extent that there's incidents there that erodes the public trust uh, to Bryson's point, you know, we do have to be concerned about that. So uh, I think in, the good news is there's a, a lot better awareness today of the threats and some of the dynamics than there was in 2016, just more broadly uh, in all sectors, not just elections. Uh, when it comes to our infrastructure, I, I like to think California is leading the way. You know, we have established our own uh, testing and certification requirements for voting systems in California that exceed what's recommended by the EAC that most states follow. You know, things like requiring paper ballots, of course, and keeping your uh, machines offline, you know, but uh, whether it's uh, the, the code that, but that uh, supports uh, systems, the, the firewall encryption levels, et cetera, et cetera. I think California is on the forefront because we have, uh, be, be, thanks to the governor and the legislature, invested in upgrading or replacing the voting systems in all 58 counties to newer, more secure systems. Uh, but uh, I, I do think the biggest threat or concern for me today is the misinformation and disinformation that persists out there, not just, but especially on social media. Uh, I think my personal opinion, I'm not going to put this on other panelists, but the, the lack of sufficient response, I'll be diplomatic at that, uh, to, to, to 2016 uh, has uh, served as an invitation, uh, not just for agents of the Russian government to continue, uh, potentially others, uh, and even domestic actors who uh, uh, either get thrills off of uh, creating that chaos or sowing doubt in our elections. So it's up the Andy for elections officials uh, to correct the record when we need to uh, and inform voters of where they should go for official, reliable, trustworthy information on voter registration or actually voting. And that's of course your county elections office and the secretary of state. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Matt, it sounds like the states are relying very heavily on the Department of Homeland Security. What's being done differently at the federal level now versus 2016? Yeah, absolutely. So much. And, and Secretary Padilla uh, really touched on it. But in 2016, 2017, we're in an environment uh, where we didn't have the trust of the states. I mean, there was literally states accusing 
uh, the Department of Homeland Security of attempting to hack them, right? So that's the trust deficit we were at. Uh, and so it was incumbent on us to build a relationship with them and to meaningfully provide value. It's one thing to talk and engage uh, with state and local election officials, but they demand more. They demand accountability, they demand support services. And so that's where our focus has been. Uh, Secretary Padilla mentioned having me on speed dial. It works both ways. Uh, I know I can reach out to him or they, uh, his colleagues can reach out to me across all 50 states. Uh, we have relationships with all of them, thousands of local election jurisdictions, providing information, providing support and services, everything from pen testing uh, to cyber hygiene scans, to incident response, uh, ensuring that they have the information they need, whether it's general risk information, whether it's trend analysis on what we're seeing out in the field where uh, election officials can improve, or where, whether it's specific technical threat indicators, that's getting out through our information sharing and analysis center to them in uh, timely fashion so that they can defend their systems and most importantly, take that next step, talk to their voters about the steps they've taken to protect the systems, about the steps they've taken to manage the risk uh, and ensure resilience in the elections process. Uh, because in the end, as Bryson so correctly pointed out, uh, it, it doesn't take someone actually accessing the system to raise doubts, to raise concerns, and, and election officials are the ones best positioned to talk to their voters directly about everything they've done and the good work that's happened uh, over the last three years to protect systems. There's still improvements to be made. There's still a lot to do uh, in the lead up to this election, uh, but there's so much that's gone on. The, the other area I'll highlight is the level of collaboration and coordination across the federal government. Uh, for DHS, CISA, for FBI, for DOD, for the intelligence community as a whole, this is a top priority. And what we see uh, is the amount of collaboration, the amount of information sharing, the willingness of the intelligence community to downgrade uh, classified information, to get it out uh, to state and local officials is, is really uh, working in this space. And it, it's a, a level that I'm told by many uh, is, is unlike what they've seen in other areas of mission. I think, we, again, we could still improve really getting stuff unclassified completely and shared broadly, not just with election officials, but the American public. But there's been a lot of good work uh, done there. And that support uh, is directly towards our state and local partners like Secretary Padilla. It, it does build a lot of confidence to know that the uh, at the federal level that uh, the organizations are really collaborating with each other. That's so important. And it sounds like there's some excellent information sharing going on between the federal and the state levels. Uh, Matt, you, you talked about the con that kind of information sharing. Do you find that the states are all using that type of information sharing or are some using it more than others? Yeah, I mean, each state's postured differently. Uh, we have uh, gotten great feedback on what we're pushing. I, I think we continue to look for ways to improve, to make it actionable, particularly for your mid to small county level officials. The reality is we, we have our 50 states and five territories, but we have over 8,800 local jurisdictions that run elections in this country. In a state like Wisconsin, you have 1,800 localities responsible for running elections just in Wisconsin. And so how do we make this information digestible and usable so that they can take it and say, okay, this is what it means for my systems. This is the steps I need to take. And I will tell you, this is the biggest area of focus for us right now. And I know for state officials, how do we get IT support down to the local level, those mid to small counties, the majority of which uh, uh, run elections in this country. Not everyone's Los Angeles County, right? The largest jurisdiction in this country. How do we help Cheryl in Jackson County, Ohio, understand what's being sent to her, how to patch a system, how to segment a network, how to implement multi-factor authentication. Uh, that's the challenge in front of us still uh, to help provide that support. And the states are doing really tremendous work. Uh, many states have implemented cyber navigator programs where they're sending state IT officials out into the counties to help do this kind of assessment. Uh, but there's a lot more we could be doing. And, and this has been a big focus for us at CISA. We've reached over 5,000 jurisdictions uh, with what we call our last mile effort to get them that base level information of the, the steps they can take to really manage risk and build resilience. And if I can just uh, expand on that a little bit, because I mean, you know, Matt's painted the picture of what happens at the federal level and uh, when the feds contact a, a state elections official, or maybe even a local. You know, I can tell you that similarly, we work with a lot of other state partners in California. It's uh, you know the National Guard, California Highway Patrol, our state office home, of homeland security, and, and other partners. You know, similarly sharing information uh, and uh, expertise, uh, and just as a the federal government reaches out to the states. We, I, the Secretary of State, have a constant dialogue and partnership with each of the 58 counties in California that are in turn looping in their uh, county government uh, counterparts, whether it's on the public safety side, on the IT side, uh, et cetera. So it's really that collective 
coordination, communication, and collaboration that is, that is key here. Uh, and in California, we even invited the public uh, to be a part of it. We launched a Vote Sure initiative in 2018, uh, modeled after what we learned in 2016, you know, in addition to responding to uh, erroneous information that we may find online uh, and uh, providing official reliable information proactively we set up a portal where voters can email us directly if they come across either suspicious or what they know is frankly just bad information about elections and on opportunity to vote. Uh, we do a quick review. We've established uh, protocols with you know the Facebooks, Twitters, Instagrams of the world uh, to bring uh, wrong uh, posts and content to their attention. Uh, and uh, you know, it's been such a good partnership, about 98% of what we bring to their attention is pretty promptly taken down for violating the standards of that social media platform. So the public has a role to play as well in terms of being aware. You know, if they see something, say something. We've heard that before, not just at the airport. Uh, and uh, it's worked well in elections. And we're going to have to keep uh, that awareness level up for the next uh, couple of months. Well, thanks very much. It's very encouraging to know that that type of communication is going on. Uh, I'd like to turn our attention now towards uh, some of the more traditional voting processes. Uh, there are ways of uh, interfering with those voting processes. Uh, Bryson, I was wondering if you could address what are the different ways of compromising those traditional processes, ranging from voter registration all the way through counting of the ballots? Uh, yeah, just quickly following on what, what Alex said, I, I want to highlight um, the joint agency panel that Matt and I were on at DEF CON, because one of the big things that we, we highlighted, what he, which he just said, is um, each of the agencies um, noted how you could contact them to the see something, say something. Um, and then we published that after DEF CON. So that was, that was one of the big things that came out as the question to all of the hackers at that conference was, well, how do I get involved? Um, and I think that also then ties in with um, we're all American citizens and American citizens are the ones who can volunteer and be a part of these polling stations and these things. So where I'm trying to lead that is particularly here at OWASP, right? This is also a technical conference. Yes. And uh, even though that it's going to be in October and we're recording it it's a little bit in advance, I think there's still that same call to action um, for everybody in this conference that has something very unique to add. Because when I look at the biggest risk area that I see, it goes to, and I'm not picking on Cheryl in Ohio that Matt called out, but it's that there are all of these staff who are working with antiquated systems. They don't necessarily know what the gold standard is for defense and doing those things, let alone the equipment and the complexity that, that follows with it. And that's really a challenge um, because the number one attack surface, if I'm ever gonna go after any target anywhere for anything ever is phishing. Why do I like fishing? I like fishing because one, it's a game of statistics. So there are a lot of folks, particularly, I'm sure there are a lot of folks in this audience who are gonna be like, well, I'm a sophisticated technical user. I would never fall for a fish. Right. I, that's, that's simply not true, right? I, am a, I, I have worked offensive research for over 20 years. I come out of the military and, and intelligence world uh, where um, I was actually targeted for various things. And I still am not confident with my elevated knowledge and awareness that I, would not, I wouldn't fall for a fish. It can happen to anybody because they're so hard to see all of the time. They're meant to look that way. But the real thing is the game of statistics. It costs me just as much to send one fish as it does to send 10 million fish. So I'm just going to keep playing the numbers there. And then you basically, it's like when you invite the vampire in, the garlic no longer works. It's the same thing with getting hacked. Once you click that fish, they're in the system. So at this point, it's kind of a question of, right, this, this would be where I would love to show, throw, you know, kind of a high level generic diagram of all the systems in play of an election system architecture. But fundamentally, it starts with voter registration that goes into poll books. Poll books have recently, not recently, but have increasingly become more electronic because that's my way to be able to match voter to registration in real time. And things are always changing, right? Is that a provisional ballot? Have you moved? What can I do to make sure that we can capture your vote? Then we have the actual system itself, the voting machine um, that's going to be capturing the votes. And then the various levels from local to state level management systems. I do want to note that for the audience that aren't familiar with this, you notice I didn't say anything about federal. Um, as 
Alex and Matt have been talking about, this is all managed at the local and state level. So as wonderful or not wonderful as you think the feds or DHS is or isn't, this really comes down to Alex and his team down below him and all of those volunteers that you can be a part of to understand and improve those issues with uh, surface area. Um, something else that Alex mentioned is he was talking about how we'd like to make sure our systems are offline. So people in critical infrastructure are very aware of the concept of an air gap. An air gap is where you can't just access my computer easily, whatever that device is easily from the internet. Because of course, the internet allows the, the attack space to be anywhere. I can be in any country anywhere. And as long as I have IP, I can get to it. The challenge is that air gaps are never 100% air gaps. At some point, they have to connect to something. Um, because if, if something sits over there in isolation, it's hard for me to get to it. So how do I get to it? What's the maintenance around that? Who are the people that are all a part of that? That's going to be a part of my targeting when I look at how do I get to the stuff that's of interest. Keep in mind what we've all been saying about disinformation and the narrative. I never actually have to accomplish anything across that. I just have to give the illusion that you're not 100% confident that I didn't. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest risk that I see. And I, I want to throw another um, compliment to a, a lot of the work that's been done between Fed and the state level that a great majority of the networks that are actually doing these systems are monitored now. And that's a relatively new thing. And why I think that's important is going back to that narrative. If something happens, we have the ability to detect it whether that's mail-in ballots, whether that's voter fraud, whether that's somebody actually trying to manipulate a system, whether that's somebody trying to manipulate a system um, that just displays the results and the fundamental, you know, real part is still there. Because if I can change the, what looks like election results on that night, then that's going to create chaos when the next day you have to go back and say, well, actually, no, that, that wasn't the case. So our ability to detect that is key. Um, and then that, that final piece is, um, that's the element where I, I know the question wasn't really about mail-in ballots, but I think that considering the increased amount of risk on that narrative, mail-in ballots inherently take longer to count. And so folks who are used to staying up late into the night and having a winner declared in whatever election, that is most likely not going to be the case here. And that's something that could stretch for one to two to three weeks. And that is an opportunity for us to lose control of that narrative, even though the problem exactly what it should be doing with integrity that's a, that's a huge point bryce and uh if i if i can you know california's kind of developed a reputation uh, uh, for being notoriously slow to finish counting ballots uh, in prior election cycles you know, i think for starters you know frankly we have a heck of a lot more voters in california than most other states so it's you know surely a function of volume uh but yeah the process for uh you know verifying signatures and all those sorts of things that help maintain the integrity of vote by mail, uh, I think will be exacerbated this uh, election because so many other states are ramping up uh, and expanding vote by mail, maybe for the first time or more significantly than they have in a long time. Uh, so, you know, in California, every election night, we have a pretty good sense of where most contests are headed in terms of results. But for closed contests and for final numbers, it is going to take a couple of weeks. And so, you know, when I mentioned earlier, we've got to be vigilant and aware for the next couple of months. That includes post-election, uh, because if the race is too close to call in uh, a handful of states, let's say, oh, for purposes of example, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, et cetera. Uh, then we may not know who the winner is the day after or the day after that. And you know, that creates that space for lies and conspiracy theories and all those sorts of things. So we have a work cut out for us to set expectations now with the public and the press of what uh, election night may be like and may not be like. Uh, you know, one, one of the tools, speaking of vote by mail, that we're expanding statewide in California. A couple of counties have had it in the past, but statewide, we launched a, a program called Where's My Ballot? Uh, and any voter can subscribe to receive text message alerts, email alerts, or automated phone alerts on the status of their ballot as it's working its way through the Postal Service, both on the way to the voter and on the way back to the county, with the final alert being the confirmation that your ballot was received and counted. It's great for transparency, great for accountability, and great for the peace of mind that we've been talking about so much that uh, voters deserve to have uh, in the process. And uh, look, with the recent chatter about the Postal Service and their resources and rule changing, 
you know, we just uh, created a, a dashboard for ourselves to identify you know, any bottlenecks or delays in real time uh, to be able to take action on them, working in partnership with postal service representatives at the, the regional and, and local level. So, so much of this sounds like it's focused on making sure that the electorate has the confidence, even if everything goes right, if the electorate doesn't feel as though everything has gone right. Uh, and, 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 then, and then even uh, when things go wrong, there's... Uh, it, there's backstops uh, to those, uh, whether it's the ability to get a replacement ballot if, uh, you know, you made a mistake on one or, or, or what have you. If you missed a deadline, things like same day registration, you know, people who need to vote in person for uh, whatever reason. It's not a vote by mail only election. And, you know, if, if things really go, go uh, uh, hey, why are you always have a chance to cast a provisional ballot? will take longer to verify and count, but it will be counted. So uh, people uh, deserve to, to, to feel good about participation. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the topic of auditing uh, the, the election. And uh, can you speak, uh, uh, Secretary Badia or, or Matt, can you speak to the importance of uh, the audit trail and what techniques are used to audit votes? Right. So I'll, I'll lead and then uh, invite Matt to, to chime in with more of a national picture, but uh, you know, most states do have some level of post-election audit requirement. Uh, in California, every county is required to conduct a post-election audit uh, after every election. You know, so uh, we spoke earlier about the, the testing and certification requirements for voting systems. Keeping them offline is part of that. In California, paper ballots, paper ballots and a voter verifiable paper audit trail. Not just so that when we count, we're counting paper ballots. When we need to recount, we recount paper ballots. And when it comes to auditing, you know, we're auditing paper ballots. Uh, for most recent California history, it's been a matter of taking a 1% manual tally, right? making sure that the hand count matches up with the machine count to ensure the uh, accuracy uh, of the results. Uh, we're one of the handful of states moving from that uh, simple 1% policy to more of a risk limiting audit model, right? More a sophisticated methodology that uh, should result in a higher degree of confidence in the outcome of the results. Again, both important for accuracy and integrity uh, of the results. Yeah, just to, to build off what Secretary Padilla said, uh, this has been a huge area of focus for us at DHS. Uh, we've been talking about it since 2017. That, that resilience, that ability to have an auditable paper record uh, is really, really critical for exactly the reason Secretary Padilla lays out. Even if uh, nothing's happened to any of the systems, if there's concerns raised, uh, you have to have that ability uh, to go back and, and check and recheck. And, and election officials have put a lot of time into this. What we've seen since 2016 uh, to, to 2020 as a market increase in the uh, use of systems that provide that audible paper record, we're in the mid 80 percent. Uh, in 2016, we're going to be up over 92 percent or so of record uh, votes cast uh, having that audible paper record in this upcoming election. And what that means uh, is that the vast, vast majority of votes can, in fact, be audited after the election. Now we have to take that next step. Right. And Secretary Padilla hit on it exactly. We have to audit those records. We have to have a process in place. The majority of states do. And now it's a question of how do we improve the efficiency and effectiveness uh, of that audits. At, at CISA, we put our money where our mouth is on this. Uh, we've invested in the development of an open source post-election audit tool uh, that many states are using, uh, either piloting or using statewide, uh, in order to help support those efficient, effective audits, those risk-limiting audits uh, that folks are looking to do. So uh, I really think this is an area of great improvement since 2016, but an area that's going to get much and much better uh, because auditing is now part of what election officials do. And now it's just a matter of finding out the best ways to do it, to offer the most transparency and the most confidence that your vote was counted as cast. I just wanted to jump, can I jump in real quick? Cause I, both of them mentioned risk limited auditing, but I have a feeling our audience one doesn't quite know what that means. And two sure. is technically uh, savvy enough to, to appreciate it. So um, where Alex was talking about shifting from a simple 1% to a risk limited audit, what they do is they take a sample of the, um, results to look to see if there's anything that is statistically significant that would call in the results into question. And if there is, you just in keep, you keep increasing the sample size all the way going to 100%, of course, is the possibility. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that we're using mathematics and statistics to draw a conclusive result that we can back up based on the overall 
population of the ballots. Well, thanks very much for that, that clarification. Appreciate that, Bryson. Um, since we are talking to the OWASP audience and web application security is very important to them, I thought we should talk a little bit about the Votes mobile uh, voting platform. Uh, there, Bryson, can you describe that system and the pros and cons of it? Sure, so Votes spelled with a Z. Um, so Votes is a blockchain enabled um, mobile app um, that has been used in elections in uh, West Virginia, Oregon, um, Utah, and some smaller runoffs and municipals in uh, Colorado. Um, so first I would like to point out that, you know, whether we like it or not, the, the future is always coming. Um, I don't want to draw a, a, the line of all of the potential for risk and um, the immaturity, I think that's the fair way to phrase it, the immaturity where the platform is now versus where it could go. Um, so first let's look at Estonia. Estonia has established a tradition of online voting to the point where every one of their citizens, not that there are a lot of them, I mean, California is like how many multiples of Estonia, uh, but they have managed considering who's on their doorstep and the amount of friction that they've had in their process to establish a fairly robust system where voters can use any computer on the internet to be able to vote. Part of why they're able to do that is they have a very robust um, digital identification infrastructure. We don't have that. So that's, that's the problem. And why that's important is because mobile phones are inherently insecure. No matter how awesome you are as an application developer, your application still has to run on this device and you don't know what else has access on that device to do anything. Um, this is what I always tell everybody when people are like, well, how do you hack something? Aren't you worried about encryption? I'm like, no, I don't. I never attack encryption directly. I just wait for your device to decrypt it and then I take the information. And it's the same kind of problem that you would have with like a mobile app. Um, my friends over at uh, Trail of Bits, um, a New York City based um, uh, hacking company, um, they did a, a study on the votes platform and they found numerous issues um, with how it was implemented. Um, but like I said, I don't want to cast out on it from that result. I think that the platform needs a lot of work, but I think it is something that could someday be of interest tied into things like the bill that's pending um, in Congress, looking at how we can establish digital identification. Because if we can do that, we now have the ability to confidently know electronically who somebody is. And then that solves a lot of the problems where you working in a platform that might not be secure I could still have the confidence to know what happened or who did it. Yeah. If I can just offer a, a, a much more low tech <laughs> uh, comment on this discussion, because uh, I get it all the time. When are we going to be able to vote online or when can I cast my vote through the internet, et cetera? Uh, there's a key distinction between the act of voting and a ton of the other transactions that we have quickly gotten used to doing online, whether it's gaming or banking or paying parking tickets or whatever. Uh, the difference being our, we have a secret ballot in America, right? The privacy of our vote uh, is critical, you know, from, from day one uh, in, in our democracy uh, to try to guard against uh, bribery and coercion and those sorts of things. So while we can't tell who votes, we can't tell, you know, who voted for who on their ballot. And uh, obviously the, the architecture of the internet uh, has failed to provide the guarantee of that privacy and secrecy. So until uh, those measures are in place on a more broad uh, and uh, proven basis, uh, elections should be one of the last things to migrate to uh, uh, being done online. Yeah, so, Alex, I just, if I, can I, sorry, can I just real quick jump on that? Cause that actually ties back to a panel that I had with the um, CEO and founder of Votes a few months ago. And he drew the corollary. He was like, well, you know, financial infrastructure already is using a lot of these same processes. We're like, yeah, but the error rate in that is one to 5%. And that is an unacceptable error rate when we're talking about our election infrastructure. Right, so, somebody hacks your credit card, or you can uh, contest that with your bank and, and resolve it after the fact. Not mm -hmm. so much when uh, election results are declared and people are sworn into office. Yeah, the, the, the other part of this is that election officials have recognized uh, this risk uh, and have found creative ways to cut down some of the time. A lot of times 
Uh, when we talk about uh, mobile delivery of ballots or even email of ballots, we're talking about serving military and overseas voters because there are real challenges there. Uh, mm -hmm. Secretary Padilla and his staff could certainly uh, speak to that. And so uh, what election officials have done is, is found, and, and frankly, the now federal law uh, captures, you could do uh, online ballot delivery and still receive that physical record back, right? And we know uh, CISA did a risk assessment around online ballot delivery, marking, and return. There are ways to manage the risk around online ballot delivery, on online marking. Uh, online return right now, uh, from a security perspective, for exactly the reasons that Bryson and, and Secretary Padilla laid out, just, just can't be done securely with the level of, of confidence that we need to run elections. Uh, but there are ways to serve voters and election officials, whether it's, it's that online ballot delivery and return, the tracking systems that Secretary Padilla has mentioned, just offering more time uh, it, for folks to be able to return ballots. Uh, there are ways to do this and really make sure that folks are empowered without taking on that, that heightened risk uh, that, that uh, online ballot return uh, really has. And so from, from our perspective at CISA, we know uh, there's a need to serve these voters. It's important. Uh, and, and I think election officials have really found uh, the sweet spot between security and and uh, access in offering things like online ballot delivery and marking without taking needing to take that further step of, of online return. We're just not there yet. Uh, but as Bryson said, technology will evolve, you know, uh, over time. Well, I'd like to ask each of you. Uh, so let's look forward a bit uh, by 2024. Uh, you know, can we have uh, online voting based applications for voting? Uh, do you think it's possible to have by 2024 and what would have to be done? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't see it. I think there's still too much that needs to be done and proven uh, before we uh, uh, introduce that into the act of voting itself. But I want to be precise, right? If you think of our democracy as a flowchart, uh, I think there's a lot of room for technology to improve the voter experience from the registration side to the education side to, you know, even bifurcating, you know, the ballot process as, as Matt mentioned, it's, you know, first half is delivery from the county to the voter. The, the other part is the voter sort of casting their vote. And then there's, of course, you know, tabulation, audits, reporting and results, et cetera. So if you look at that whole spectrum of activity, I think there's plenty of room for technology to improve on how we're doing things. But uh, when it comes to the cast, the, the casting of your vote, uh, not, not right now, not soon. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give a really untechnical answer that Bryson could fill in the technical. The, the reality is uh, elections are evolutionary, not revolutionary in, in many ways. Fast changes uh, are generally not recommended. Uh, the change technologically that would need to take place to do it securely uh, we're not there. I mean, it, there's general consensus across the entire security community about that, that the architecture isn't there. Uh, you know, folks like Matt Blaze have suggested you, you need to uh, reconfigure the Internet itself in some ways to tackle this. And so uh, 2024 is uh, for many election officials right around the corner. When you think about systems and, and process and implementation, uh, we may get there, uh, but I wouldn't make any predictions about the next presidential election in that way. I'll give you a, an example of a, another use of technology that we've uh, deployed to, again, add, uh, add security and improve public confidence. Uh, a lot of us may be familiar if uh, there's suspicious activity on your credit card, your, your bank attempts to reach you to verify, hey, is this really you? Um, and, uh, and you can confirm that whether it's a, through a phone call or increasingly you get an email, right? Was, was this really you? Uh, so we built that capacity into our voter registration systems, right? Voting and its infrastructure is one thing. Our voter registration databases is another. Uh, a lot of states allow for online voter registration or updating of your voter registration record. So in California now, we uh, uh, confirm changes to a voter registration record to a voter uh, at their email address. And if they change that on file, we'll send it to both the new and the old. So a voter who now gets an email saying, thank you for updating your registration record, it's either confirmation of something that they just did, or if it wasn't them, they know to contact the county immediately so we can uh, rectify that situation. Bryson, you have an opinion about 2024? All right, so I, I bet and clean up here. Um, I don't think we're gonna see any significant changes by 2024. Um, uh, Matt captured that really well. There's going to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Um, and there are so many missing components of confidentiality, the privacy, 
um, the assurance of integrity. And then we haven't talked about it a whole lot, but availability of these systems. Um, again, um, the, easy, the second easiest attack that I can do short of getting you to click on an email is sending enough traffic to flood and overwhelm your services that something goes down. And those are very hard to come back from, right? The denial of service attack. Um, I think the problem is the same. Um, so I, was, uh, I, I did an interview with CNN a year and a half ago, and they were asking me about deep fakes. They're like, oh, well, how's the world going to you know, solve the deep fake problem? And I was like, I don't think there's anything to solve. Whether a deep fake is real or not, what, however realistic it looks, you have three kinds of people. You have people who are going to believe it because they want to believe it. You have people who aren't going to believe it because they don't want to believe it. And then you're going to have that middle ground that potentially can be swayed by the idea. And so I think that the biggest thing that has pulled as the narrative throughout this panel is, again, it's all around transparency, trust, and communication. Mm -hmm. We need the intelligence community to be sharing information and declassifying information more readily with the public. That information needs to be shared more freely for operational reasons to the state and to the local level. Um, from a technology perspective, I'm not really worried about the technology. The entire combination of local, state, and federal governments have rallied and really brought together a combined and amazing response across this country that makes me feel comfortable as a citizen participating in it. I'm still worried about all of my fellow citizens and the disinformation that is both domestic and foreign that continues to erode our belief and trust in our own democracy and its process. Thank you. Well, we're, <clears throat> we're running out of time. I'd like to uh, finish up with what have, what would you like to talk about in terms of election security? What are the challenges or what advice do you have that we haven't discussed today? And also I'd like to uh, uh, borrow something that was done during the DEF CON uh, election security panel that uh, Madam Bryson were on. And that was uh, if there's some place that you would like the audience to know that they can contact uh, with him uh, for information or to report something. So I'll um, like to hear what we haven't discussed that you'd like to talk about and where you think people can get more information or report something. Uh, uh, Secretary Padilla? Sure. Uh, for uh, for uh, California residents and California voters, uh, one-stop shop at vote.ca.gov for registration options, for verifying your registration status, for poll worker information, cybersecurity information, uh, the whole gamut, uh, all in one location. Uh, so uh, I, I think if uh, there's one uh, area that we haven't touched on, uh, and it's not uh, high tech by any means, uh, it's um, you know, kind of make a plan for voters who may be worried about uh, whether it's if I vote by mail, what's the security of it or impacts of the postal service, or if I vote in person, what's the security of it? How do I stay safe during COVID? All those sorts of things. You know, we're working diligently at the state and at the local level to provide multiple options to vote and vote safely. And we're gonna safeguard uh, the, the, that ballot and the vote counting process. Uh, but it is not as beneficial for public confidence if voters aren't aware. Uh, they need to be aware of their options and they need to be aware of what to do. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier in California, we're sending a mail-in ballot to every active registered voter uh, in California prior to the election. So we want to make sure they're anticipating that ballot in their mailbox, their option to track the ballot, both coming and going the in-person options for voters who need it. And so uh, the more we do to educate voters uh, and encourage them to make a plan, uh, hopefully they vote early. I don't think there's too many people waiting till the day before the election to decide how to vote on this one. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the top of the ticket, I'm talking up and down the ballot. So if you vote by mail, send that ballot in early if you can. If you're gonna vote in person and they offer early voting in your jurisdiction, vote early if you can. And uh, you know, know to direct the questions and seek answers from those official reliable sources of information that your county elections office and the Secretary of State. Thank you. Uh, Bryson, would you like to address this? Uh, sure, so I had talked about uh, a call out for help. Uh, the University of Chicago um, put forth something called the Election Cyber Surge, which are inviting other IT professionals to come in and help uh, the, the local folks who, who need help with just the technology side. Um, at the citizen level, I mean, volunteering and being a poll worker, getting involved and in being a part of that process is, is an element. Um, specific, um, I'll let Matt talk to the, the contacts that he's got for CISA and EISAC. Um, 
I will tell um, what FBI said was there's FBI.gov slash tips as their website, or you can write to SciWatch, C-Y-Watch at FBI.gov or the Election Assistance Commission with uh, security at EAC.gov for contact points. Thank you. And Matt? Yeah, just uh, completely agree with, with both Bryson and, and Secretary Padilla. Secretary Padilla touched on uh, one part of, of uh, what we're looking for voters uh, to do or, or be heading into this election, and that's prepared. Having a plan, understanding your options, am I registered? What's on my ballot? What, what's my plan to engage with the process? The second is being patient. Uh, understanding it takes time to get you a ballot. It can take time to return a ballot. Uh, if you show up in person uh, with physical distancing going on, you may have a line, uh, but having that plan, being ready to, to uh, engage the process, and then being a, a voter that participates, and, and Bryson nailed it. Uh, we, we need poll workers. We need election workers across this country, uh, 250,000 or more uh, nationwide before November. And so uh, the ability for, for someone to serve as a poll worker that's healthy, that feels safe, is really critical to serving our other citizens. The best part about it, uh, particularly for, for this community, uh, is if you have questions or concerns about the security of the process, there's no better way to learn about the process, the re resilience that's built into it, than to serve as an election worker. And so if you go, if you go to uh, helpamericavote.gov, it's run by the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, that's a site you can go to to get signed up as an election worker uh, and really help serve your fellow citizens to be a participating voter. If you can't do that, if you don't feel safe, there's so many other ways to participate. You can watch pre-election testing of voting systems across the states. You can uh, engage directly with your state and local election officials to have your questions answered. This is why we run elections at the state and local level, because those uh, who run the process are part of your community. They're, they're uh, you know, uh, uh, fellow soccer moms or dads with you. They serve on, on your church boards with you. Ask them, get engaged with them, uh, understand the process in your state. That's what creates a prepared, a patient and a participating voter. Uh, that's what we're going to need heading into this. Uh, if you have any uh, cybersecurity concerns or anything to share, uh, to share with CISA, uh, simply send it to uh, central, C-E-N-T-R-A-L at CISA dhs.gov. Uh, we take that in. Uh, we can get out to all 50 states uh, and thousands of local jurisdictions if you have vulnerabilities. If you identify a vulnerability in a state or local system, start by reporting directly to them, though. They're the ones that know their systems. They're the ones that could best remediate the issue. If you're, ha if you're not having success there, uh, CISA stands ready to help you. We do it all the time, uh, and we're ready to serve. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of OWASP, I'd like to thank each one of you for your participation today and for a very informative panel. Thank you very much.